Welcome back, thanks to our third panel of the day, entitled Expanding Our Reach. I'll give people in the lobby a second to come in once they heard the microphone. Welcome back to our third panel of the day, entitled Expanding Our Reach. Sebastian Ruth is the founder and artistic director of Community Music Works, a nationally recognized organization that works to build civil society in the United States by creating new roles for musicians to positively influence American cities. Since 2013, Sebastian has served as a visiting lecturer at the Yale School of Music. Micah Hendler, founder and director of the YMCA Jerusalem Youth Chorus, is a graduate of Yale College in Music and International Studies. TJ Harper is Associate Professor of Music and the Director of Choral Activities and Music Education at Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island. Emily Howe is a conductor, music educator, and accompanist. A faculty member at Boston University's Prison Education Program Howe's work co-designing a music curriculum at the Framingham Women's Prison earned her the distinction of prison arts scholar. Thomas Cavanis, composer, writes for opera, theater, dance, film, and the concert stage. He is also active in creative approaches to music education and musical engagement. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, welcome back from lunch. This is the time of day at a conference where you, your brain has no blood because all your blood is busy digesting your lunch. And so it's the time of day where in some parts of the world we take a nap. <laughs> and we've just dimmed the lights that will facilitate your nap taking. <laughs> but, uh, on our panel conference call, we decided that the best way to lead off would be to show examples uh, of our work and or some other kinds of show and tell on the screen. So I think you'll find this so energizing <laughs> that you will stay awake and that at least by about two o'clock, you'll be like, oh yeah, I'm awake, I'm at a conference, this is great. Um, so uh, I, I really like the language that um, Jeff and his colleagues used to describe the topic here. Um, and that is, you know, what ties our work together, as you'll see over the next 75 minutes or so, um, is that we're each working with populations, as, as Jeff has called it, um, who are maybe outside the expected circle uh, of constituents for the kind of music we're working in. And that's, if, if you're paying attention, you might realize that's a, an intentional uh, choice of language that doesn't use the word outreach. Um, and, and I think several of us share in this feeling that outreach implies two bodies of people or institutions. On the one hand, you have the, in, in the case of most of you, the choral art or the tradition of music. And outreach might imply that that is just reaching a helping hand out to someone with the sort of metaphorical idea that then they would be bringing them back. And I think there's a different approach to the work um, that many of us take, which is to say the people who are going to engage in this are very much the subject and the object of this work. Uh, and the institution or traditions for, you know, that we may be familiar with are not the priority. Um, the repertoire may be the priority, the approach of pedagogy um, may be the priority, or may, there may be innovation there. But in, in fact, we're trying to create new musical traditions and new contexts 
um, so that the music uh, that we're working with has the greatest opportunity for transformative impact. So I really like this idea of, of thinking about people outside the expected circle, or maybe a, a, to, to expand on that metaphor, expanding the, the circle. Um, so we will each take a few minutes to, to introduce some element of our work, and we, we all decided there would be a um, snapshot rather than an overview approach. So we'll each take a, a moment to give you a snapshot of some element of our work, which will save time for us to, to speak amongst ourselves a little bit, um, obviously for you, not at you, um, but with, this, with, with the topic of um, uh, what is it about work that we do um, that has some similarity, or what are some of the lessons learned, what are some of the values behind the work that may be helpful to others of you who find some of this inspiring and might like to venture into some of this kind of work. Um, and then we'll, we'll save enough time for hopefully a robust interactive conversation, um, 20 or 25 minutes at the end so that we can ask questions of each other and um, we'll expect long lines behind each microphone because you'll be awake and engaged by that point in the hour. Okay, so um, let me first welcome Micah. Uh, and his work with the YMCA Jerusalem Youth Corps. So this is uh, very surreal uh, for me personally um, as I just graduated. Hi. <clears throat> this is very surreal for me personally as I actually uh, remember just uh, doing my DS lectures in this room uh, in 2008, um, so, or in 2007 actually, whatever. Anyway, it was not that long ago, mm -hmm. and so I'm, this is kind of a meta moment, but um, the work that, that I do in Jerusalem obviously is with uh, Israeli and Palestinian youth. The YMCA Jerusalem Youth Chorus uh, should be landing at JFK around now, and uh, hopefully you'll all have a chance to hear them perform and see really what we're talking about tomorrow. Uh, but this is a chance also to get sort of behind the scenes and a little bit of what actually makes a chorus like that possible and what kinds of values and what kinds of uh, community structures make work like this possible and how like particularly using community singing can facilitate these kinds of spaces that we were talking about. Uh, earlier this morning, even in a context of extreme ethnic conflict and violence. Um, so the only, most of my sort of intro will actually be showing this music video, um, but just to give it a little bit of context, this is a video that we made um, with also two friends of mine actually from the Duke's Men, from my time at Yale, Ben Wexler who did the arrangement, and Sam Shuey who is now a YouTube superstar and who will be soloing. Um, basically of this song that talks in many ways about the journey that our Israeli and Palestinian teens go through when deciding to be part of this chorus. Um, and not only that, maybe it's beautiful or maybe it's nice, but really the hardships also that they go through and how they are there for one another um, in creating a space where they can all feel at home, even in a city that really does not value that I'll say as a central principle. Um, so I will just show you the video and we can talk about it later. Ooh.
Cause I'm gonna make this place your home So are you awake? <laughs> um, what a beautiful way to start. Um, Emily, uh, you heard the introduction, so I will just cue up her presentation and get out of the way. Emily, hi. Thank you very much, and thank you for getting us off to a great start, Micah. That was really inspiring. We heard a little bit this morning from Andre de Quadros about work that he and I, along with our colleague Jamie Hillman, have been, have been doing in two prisons west of Boston in Framingham and Norfolk. I'm going to talk a bit more in detail about those experiences and, and focus really on two specific examples that contextualize our work and I think give voice to some of the challenges of expanding our reach as this panel is called. Life. For those of us who have had positive experiences making music in and as community, music is life-affirming, possibly even life-changing. 
but during this panel, we're not talking about musical lifers such as ourselves. Rather, we're acknowledging those people we have alienated and excluded and asking how we might democratize the music making process and learn from the voices of those who have previously been marginalized. What does it mean to go beyond what we know? What does it mean to embrace people with sound and with singing? What tools do we have as conductors? And what tools do we need to develop in order to bring empowering creative experiences to the people who arguably need them most? Which takes us to prison, an environment very much apart from my own life and removed from my own admittedly privileged life experiences. As one student told us, prison is a mind graveyard. It is where your body, soul, and mind go to perish. Prison, as I have experienced it, is a strange ecosystem marked by visual indicators of power and seemingly arbitrary oral cues that dictate where inmates need to be and when. As another student wrote, it is so easy here to lose yourself in order not to have to face whatever darkness brought you here. As foreign as it is to me, I have also learned that prison is disturbingly familiar to many of the people with whom we work. I recognized this for the first time when talking to a student in the men's prison. You work in the women's prison, he asked. I nodded in affirmation. How is it there? I told him that it seemed okay, different from the men's prison, which, by the way, is modeled after Harvard. <laughs> um, <laughs> true story, true story. <laughs> The architect was inspired by the Harvard campus and decided to create a prison. A prison, yes. So, <laughs> uh, so, so I said that the women's prison is a bit green, greener, possibly a bit more comfortable. Uh, he continued to ask questions. How's the food? He finally asked. I laughed and told him honestly that I had no idea. I asked him why he wanted to know how the food was in the Framingham women's prison, and he said, well, my mom's going there. I said, oh, she's visiting, she's visiting someone. And he said, no, 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 she's, she's being transferred from her prison in California. New prison, Framingham. People talk about the cycle of poverty, but I have learned that incarceration is also a cycle. And many of the people with whom we work also have parents, siblings, and children who are serving time. And here are the bleak statistics. Prison is not a community. Benjamin Harbert, who, who writes on music and incarceration, in fact theorizes it as a non-community. But the incarceration epidemic in this country disproportionately affects certain communities, poor communities, minority communities, communities that, on the whole, we are not reaching with our art, choral music. And so we must ask ourselves, how can we use music to build a bridge from the outside to the inside, to challenge people to reevaluate themselves as human beings endowed with the capacity to create. This morning, Andre shared some features of the pedagogical approach we have developed and have come to call empowering song. Uh, as he mentioned, we treat music as a bridge to personal exploration and also through the inclusion of guest artists from around the nation and the world as a bridge to the outside. We deal not only with music, but with issues of identity and the facilitation of personal and communal growth. We try to destabilize the prison environment by encouraging people to hold hands, which as Andre mentioned, not okay in prison. We hold hands, we dance, we sing, and we question authority. In our class, there are no spectators, only in the words of Augusto Boal, spect actors who are engaged in the creative process. And in a place where conformity is not only demanded by the administration, but as we heard from one of the prisoners, adopted as a coping mechanism, we encourage people to reclaim their individuality and to lift one another up as artists. Our goal is process, not product, and we are very upfront with our students that we are not training them for the Met, nor are we training them for American Idol. We are helping one another to realize our creative potential. Andre described some of the context and setting. Once again, we are working within the Boston University Prison Education Program. We teach in the Norfolk Men's Prison. We have about 20 students there in any given semester, and the Framingham Women's Prison, where we have around 10 to 15. We work with a lot of people of different ages. Our classes range from age 25 to 65, various races, various ethnicities, 
and varying sentence lengths. And few of our students in either setting have had prior musical training, which once again is why we're here talking about how we can change that. I want to share a, a few representative examples of the kinds of work that we have done, which again spans from visual work to theater to poetry. We tend to work with a theme each semester that is drawn from the repertoire that we work on. This was inspired by the words, I once was lost, but now am found, which of course come from the song Amazing Grace. And this was in the women's prison. We had the help of a, of a visual artist named Sidewalk Sam, who encouraged each student to create their own kind of patchwork in this quilt that kind of depicts their own identities. This you see is hand painted using Q-tips and magic marker. This is an image painted by a man who is inspired by the words, and neither have I wings to fly, which of course comes from the song, um, The Water is Wide. And neither have I wings to fly, give me a boat that can carry two. So this is the image of that boat. So we come back to this word, life. And I wanna share a, an example of one particular performance experience that we had together. Um, we cannot bring recording equipment into the prison, um, so I can't share any video images, but, but I'll tell this story. Judith Braha, professor of theater and guest collaborator, was facilitating small group improvisations in our class. One game she introduced is called A Kiss, A Word, A Song. In this game, each skit features one kiss, one word, and one song. The rest of the action is pantomimed. In rehearsal, everyone was having fun, laughing, working well together. But when we shared, while two skits were playful, the final skit was very different from the others. The women had arranged themselves as if in a courtroom. One woman, I'll call her Carol, was on trial. There was one judge. And the other women were watching the proceedings. The judge sat with furrowed brow, consulting imaginary notes, until finally picking up an imaginary gavel. Life. The women watching the trial all blew dismissive kisses toward Carol and walked away, leaving Carol alone on the stand. Looking up from tears, she sang Dido's Lament, remember me, but ah, forget my fate. When Carol finished singing, the room was silent. Was that an empowering experience? Carol told us that it was. Reliving her own sentencing in the context of a performance piece helped her to process her life sentence. This was not the case for everyone in the class, however. There were other women who were also serving life sentences who did not appreciate reliving that experience in a group context. So the question is, how do we as conductors and educators respond to these ambiguous, challenging, and even divisive moments? I would suggest that nothing in our training prepares us for these kinds of experiences. And so part of our own work as conductors attempting to expand our reach has to be to reevaluate our own practices, to engage with other people who are doing similar work, thank you for this conference, um, and to continue striving for best processes, not best products. I'll close with the voices of a few students. One woman wrote that coming to class is like shedding the coat of despair. The aura is bright, and I feel like I can express myself without being judged. Another wrote that for two and a half hours a week, I watch a group of women be themselves, let their hair down, and possibly show their softer sides. I see them, what they may be like beyond these walls. They take off their armors. This was also inspired by the words, and neither have I wings to fly, and the student wrote that BU has given me wings through music. So I think there are, there are many possibilities here, and I'm excited that we are all working to realize them. Thank you. So in line with ACDA's statement on advocacy, the ACDA International Conductors Exchange Program, or ICEP, was launched in 2010 as a means to build meaningful relationships with choral communities from around the world, as well as providing international opportunities for the next generation of leaders in our profession. That's fine, that's fine. 
ICP is part of a renewed focus for ACD on how choral music has the potential to reach beyond our borders to have a positive impact on communities outside of the United States. Following the 2016 exchange, this program will boast 90 alumni worldwide who have participated in one-to-one -one exchanges that are forging stronger relationships as it builds bridges between individuals and communities. In 2012, we launched our first exchange program with Cuba um, with a total of 14 conductors, seven from the United States and seven from Cuba. In 2014, our exchange with China engaged a total of 20 conductors. This year, our exchange with Sweden engages 28 conductors, and next year, our exchange with South Korea will engage another 28 conductors, 14 from the United States and 14 from Korea. These one-to-one -one exchanges have served as a catalyst for ongoing, sustained opportunities for growth and a sharing of knowledge that transcend national borders, ideologies, and religions. You know, when we started this, we had a planning meeting. Uh, Sebastian uh, gave us all a prompt in addition to the prompt from Jeff about what this panel discussion on expanding our reach really could uh, encapsulate. And one of the prompts from Sebastian was to think of a story on what it means to us to expand our reach as professionals in this field. And I couldn't help but think of my own story as a Korean adoptee and uh, maybe as an unintended consequence of that, I felt a need to always belong somewhere using Anton's expression. And this need to belong was very powerful. And so choral music was an obvious fit for me. And so being in South Korea a few years ago on a research grant, I found myself really uh, overcome with emotion. I found myself really thinking that these unintended consequences of this, of this experience in my life um, were having a profound impact on what it is that I do. And I think we know as choral musicians, anytime we come together to create something of beauty that didn't exist before, we're actually contributing to the common good. And this is something that I think is very powerful. Adam Smith, the uh, 18th century political economist, talks about um, um, unintended consequences, but in a positive aspect. He talks about the invisible hand and how when we come together, we try and do something for ourselves, we actually end up contributing to the greater good. Um, and I think this is a powerful statement. This is something that the International Conductors Exchange Program uh, as a platform. This is something that I think Tim Sharp believes in greatly. This is why he uh, was so strongly for this uh, recreation of this program. But I think that one of the things that also happens is that we, we find ourselves able to create new directions for connections. And so we have these different things that are going on. We have uh, a North Dakota Symposium on Inter International Music that happened last year. This last week, ACDA hosted the second um, Latin American Music Symposium in Austin, Texas. <clears throat> in San Juan, uh, Argentina, in November, there will be a forum of choral leadership from throughout Latin America, South and Central America, to talk about the direction of choral music um, in this part of the world. And somehow, our conductors from the China Exchange and the Sweden, Sweden Exchange got together and decided to create their own exchange program, which I think is outstanding. And so these unintended consequences, these, these things that are ultimately contributing to the common good, I think are powerful. So this advocacy statement by ACDA and Tim Sharp, they've created the platform, and now the program is going off in new directions. So I'm excited. This idea about belonging is powerful to me, is powerful, I think, to all of us. And it enables us to cross these distances, whether it's from choir to choir, state to state, um, across oceans, uh, maybe even from the Soprano 1 section to the Soprano 2 <laughs> section. So this is exciting um, work, and this is an exciting time for our profession. Thank you. So I'm next. I, um, anyone familiar with the Patakata, the tradition uh, of show and tell in Japan where you get 20 slides, 20 seconds per slide? That's about what I'm going to do here. I'm going to whip through a set of slides. Um, I'm uh, uh, going to try to share with you a particular project 
that Community Music Works uh, did a few years ago as a way of giving you a snapshot into our thinking and some of the issues and problems um, inherent in our work. This is a, an image of our headquarters in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, this is in the west side of Providence, which um, is a complex neighborhood, a lot of um, diverse, a lot of diversity associated economically, also racially and culturally. Um, and our, our mission has always been to have a professional ensemble, chamber ensemble, this is strings, I'm one of the outliers here, this is not about singing, <laughs> um, that, uh, that lives and works in the context of an urban neighborhood with the idea that we are um, uh, having a reciprocal relationship with the young people and adults in the neighborhood around us. At one level, we're practicing the thing that we were trained to do, which is chamber music. Um, at another level, we're not trying to just have a fixed tradition, but really a kind of movable, evolving tradition, and we're trying to, through these plate glass windows as a metaphor, really learn from the musical and cultural traditions of people in our neighborhood. Um, that's a, um, easier to say than to do. And so a couple of years ago, we commissioned a piece recognizing that over 60% of our students um, or from Latin American families, Latin American backgrounds, so to um, commission a piece from uh, a Venezuelan composer, Gonzalo Grau, uh, to bring together um, uh, salsa and other Latin music traditions with a classical music format, um, with our students as part of the orchestra, our professional ensemble as part of the orchestra, and a professional salsa band and violin soloist as the other pieces. Uh, what it, the, the, the moral of the story is just about how that we um, not only did the project in the kind of snapshot moment of the performance, but, but the work that we tried to do to lead up to it. So this is a, an image of sharing the work after it had just been written, showing excerpts to the students so they could start to get into it. Similar here, getting groups of students together to just study the score and start to see what was involved. And then at six months ahead of time, we pulled together a group that we called our Latino Advisory Committee. Um, a couple of my colleagues are Latino themselves, but importantly, it was th this was a question of how are we connecting with Latino leaders in our community to make this a project that connected on many levels, not only um, musically, and that also ensured that by the time the, the concert happened, we had um, made it a kind of community festival, community celebration. And so this is a, a couple of politicians who hosted a house uh, party um, in their home. The hard work got going of individual lessons to study the score and, and uh, learn the piece. Um, as many of you know who work with young people, commissioning is very exciting, but it's also somewhat daunting because um, they don't have anything to fall back on in terms of a YouTube recording or any other recording. This is you know, fresh out of the gates. Um, and then led to a kind of festival style week of you know, daily rehearsals after school with the professionals, with the students, with our, um, our own ensemble, the salsa band and, and our own ensemble, um, both musical and social hanging out. Um, the day of the show, uh, very much trying to make this uh, celebration that was multi-generational and um, this is our elementary age orchestra getting pumped before the show, um, hovered over by a local politician I'll get back to. Um, any good uh, community gathering celebration needs to involve food. We embraced that philosophy early on, uh, and in this case, um, invited a local Venezuelan restaurant to provide the, uh, the buffet. Uh, and we did this in a community space that was um, a, a gym in a community center, but as you can see from the murals in the background, that kind of celebrated the civil rights um, history, uh, in the, particularly in the black community, MLK and Rosa Parks and others emblazoned at the wall felt fitting for the event. Um, the politician is our one of our two, um, in Rhode Island we only have two, uh, US congressmen. Um, again, trying to, to make this a, a sort of widespread community celebration. Uh, and then the concert itself, right? Um, performance, which I'll, I'll give you a snippet of in a moment. When, when we have done community performances in the past, there's this funny, and this is where 
you know, it sort of gets to the heart of the mission, the heart of the work. There's this funny opportunity and divide that happens in the audiences. So um, at one level, we look around and we say, for a classical music concert, this is unusually diverse. We have um, families of our kids. We've got people from all parts of the city who normally don't come together in any cultural event. And this happens here. But then the question is, um, what does that mean? Or, or does it mean anything? Is, it, you know, is there, in fact, a community formed because uh, a Latino mom and a wealthy white donor are sitting side by side enjoying this concert? Or um, is this a, a sort of ephemeral moment that if we make nothing of it? So um, of course, the answer is dancing. Um, <laughs> but the, the um, uh, but I, mean, I, mean, I say that lightheartedly, but I think that's one of the critical questions that I became really fascinated by in our community is, you know, how do we capitalize on music bringing together diverse groups of people, but have it be more than a fleeting moment? Um, a year and a half later, we took the same project to New York for a um, uh, kind of reprise performance, which was a great sort of uplift moment for the students, having them on the road, having them play in a new context, of course, um, but also kind of a sense of like, how could we do you know, a strategic partnership with folks in another city to bring about a similar kind of um, diverse community? And I'll end, end with a short clip and we can discuss this more later. Tom Cabins. Just need to reverse the order there. Let's see. So that was the window list I tried to have up there. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Just got to the wrong one. Yeah. All right. Terrific. And then you can just. Yeah, right, right, right. Thanks. I'm learning. I'm learning. Awesome. It's the space bar we've started. Yeah, right. All right. Great. Great. We're getting to the Duke. That's great. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, so, um, another outlier, I'm a composer. I'm just uh, saying from the beginning, I'm a composer. Um, <laughs> my personal mission is to create new music. And uh, for me, the process of composing is all about making choices that make great musical expression possible. But it's not just what I do, I'm also really, really interested in striving, other, striving to help others realize their own musical ideas, especially those who have no musical training at all. That's a specific thing I'm really interested in. What is the song within a person who's never written a song, never, and, and, and doesn't have any formal training? I'm, I'm really fascinated by that. I'm lucky I get to work across generations in that work. In my work with Carnegie Hall, um, I work with mothers, young mothers and young parents to create lullabies for their own children. We actually have a, a national project around that. I get to work with preschoolers. Um, this week I'm working with fifth graders writing graduation anthems played on their recorders for their <laughs> elementary school graduation. That's Friday and I'm excited. Um, <clears throat> I also work with teens, helping them to write and produce and perform their own material. Um, and I have to say that one of my favorite forms of music is choral music. My very first musical experiences were in the musical theater. 
but I quickly figured out that if I wanted to get deeper into music, that the high school chorus was the place to go. So I joined it, and I was there for four years, 10 or two. And, <laughs> um, and I began singing with others. And for me, I think it's one of the most powerful and rewarding experiences that a human being can have. Alongside growing up in the choral world, I was also growing this expanded notion of what creating music could be both for myself and for those with whom I worked. So I began to think about how choruses might become sources of inspiration, and in turn, to become inspired too. And that has led to me to work on a variety of projects where choruses are at the center. So for our purposes today, I'm good. my snapshot is a story about a project we did in the spring of 2014 at Carnegie Hall called Sacred Ellington. And this is the trailer for it. One, two, three, go. What you see in the eyes of the young people is yeah. their desire to grow, to be stretched. These Sorry. moments are extremely important. To see something this genuine on this type of scale is one of the most powerful things that anybody will experience ever in their lives. Duke Ellington caught me off guard. It's complex, but appealing to the ear because it's jazz in a sacred way. Duke Ellington really knows how to make people feel. That's what's beautiful about it. I don't know, it's just, I love it. Jazz performance is about people. It's about connecting. There's a sense of community that comes from playing with jazz. You form bonds with people. Have <laughs> 250 people all together. Wow. It's incorporating your soul and how you feel to make the music come to life. When you hear it, you're just like, I never even thought that that was possible. You're going to want to move, clap your hands, and get up out of your seat. It's going to be an experience to remember. I don't know how to explain it. It's just a big deal. Because it's kind of hard. I think it's going to be life-changing for me. Yeah. Okay, so you get the idea. It's a chorus of 225 uh, public high school students from New York City, 25 jazz instrumentalists, professional soloists. They rehearse all year, and then in, um, in March, on a Sunday afternoon at Carnegie Hall, in the big hall in Stern Auditorium, um, they do the sacred concerts, the sacred music of Duke Ellington, and it was amazing. They brought the house down. It was a great concert. I can't show it to you because that one's not on film. But it was, it was amazing. But that wasn't all. Sacred Ellington was also about creating new music inspired by the Duke's unflagging sense of affirmation. What we did was we asked songwriters and choristers around New York City um, what they could affirm in their own lives and to try to write a song or some piece from a, deep, a, a place deep within um, that, that used the Duke's positive energy. That was the, that was the prompt. Um, there were songwriting workshops at schools. So we had three schools, and they actually created choral pieces. I'm not going to show you one of those, but they were cool too. Mm -hmm. So they wrote them for choruses, and they, they, they were very nifty pieces, beautiful pieces. Um, but there were also songwriting workshops in community centers, and that's the one I'm going to tell you about. Um, the workshop that I led was in Harlem on 127th Street and Lenox Avenue in a community center. Um, it, the work that I was doing there involved 10 young people who were on probation. Part of their sentence from the judge was a requirement to take advantage of the programming designed to help them hit the reset button and make their own way. They could choose different things, but one of them that they could choose was a songwriting workshop. So that came from the judge. Thank you, judge. Our workshop um, uh, involved several professional musicians. We actually had a whole Haitian pop band led by Emmeline Michelle. And if you, if you follow Haitian pop music, she's, she's a star. Um, we also had two recently graduated singers from the Songs of Solomon Inspiration Ensemble. That group is led by Chantel Wright in New York City. It's a great chorus. So these were kids who'd graduated out. So they weren't singing with the group anymore and were looking for work. So we hired them to be part of this group, to work with these 10 teenagers to help them write songs. One of the kids was a 15-year-old boy named Meshach. 
Despite his initial protest that he couldn't write a song, with our help, slowly, he began. About a couple weeks in, he, he wrote a couplet, a, a couple of lines, and he offered them up in our little song circle that we had going. I was thinking about you know, different song circles um, mentioned earlier in the day. And um, Meshach, for the first time in a long time, was not shut down by anybody. And in fact, Emmeline, Michelle, came up to him afterwards and said, you know, Meshach, those two lines, I think there's a song there. The next week, he came back with three fully formed verses on his phone, because that's where they write their songs now these days, is on their phone. And he read it to me in a corner of the room before the workshop started, and we had a, a chat about what his song was about. I set him up with Orson and Victor, those two singers from uh, Songs of Solomon, and they helped him chisel it down till the, the, um, the lines really made rhythmic sense. And a couple of sessions later, he really had the lyric in shape. He wrote the melody for this two-line hook um, that, that you'll see becomes the refrain of the song. And the song is really about, it's a prophecy. It's a prediction of what Meshach wants his life to be. Um, he, he talks about having been sidelined by his time in the streets, and he wants to resurrect himself. And so the song is, Living the Life I Love. So here we were at the end of 12 weeks. Now this is December of 2013. And we're in an auditorium much like this, a little bigger, school auditorium. And um, the musicians are assembled. And um, I'll, I'll let you see a little bit of, um, of Meshach. See if I can. singing his song for the very first time. And I think you can see him sort of trying to find himself there. And I love that little moment where he drops the mic cord and then where it comes apart and then he has to pick up another mic and, and sort of move on. And just to say the words, I'll read them for you for the verse. Um, I remember the days when I was scrapping to eat, dashing police, guilty of being black in the streets, lacking to sleep, Dreaming of being big grind passionately. Can't wait to spend a stack on my feet. Relax on the beach. Worries melting away like wax in the heat. I'ma make my life sweet. Money at my feet. But I'll never wind up back in the streets. So that was um, Mishak's the first verse. There are three. Um, and there were, there were ten songs premiered. Um, at that concert, and of those 10 songs, uh, Meshach's was chosen to be performed um, at Carnegie Hall, bringing together all of the citywide projects inspired by Duke Ellington. And I'm just gonna show you a little bit here of, again, this is um, just an archival recording, but here he is now at Carnegie Hall. As you can see, he's now got a trumpet and a saxophone, and um, still Emmeline Michelle, still Victor and Orson, his backup singers um, behind him, but... I'm not going to let the record. 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 I'm not going to let the record.
So, you know, one of the things, um, one of the things that I think is so cool, um, <laughs> One of the things that I think is so cool about this for Meshach was that, that reception. And who was out in the audience? It was 250, 300 choristers. That was who was cheering him on. The people who'd sung at Carnegie Hall the week before were now cheering him on. So Meshach, he got to sing at Carnegie Hall. He sung for the mayor. He's taken this song around. But he's also joined a theater company where he's writing monologues and scenes and performing them as well. That doesn't mean he's not still struggling, right? Meshach still has a very complicated family that sometimes creates more obstacles um, than they should. He has a school that is under-resourced and does not have the kinds of programs that would support his you know, interest as an artist. Um, and it still takes him a lot of work to get to the places where he can do his artistic work, but he's figuring it out and he's trying. He's now just turned um, 17 years old and, um, and we are still working with him. Um, and it, it's all, in my mind, it's all fueled by creativity, by, in this case, Duke Ellington. But at its source, and again, this might be a stretch, right? Because that doesn't look like choral music. But I would argue that what's at the center of this is, in fact, choral music. Thank you. So this is the point we can um, begin to open this up to each other, but also to you all. Um, here's a radical moment of stagecraft. Ready? Can Go. we make our tables more like a V so we can see each other? Oh, crazy. Awesome. All right. Now it's a panel where we actually can <laughs> see each other, too. Hey. Thank you. So um, I, let me draw out a couple of points, and then uh, please feel free, if you've already got comments, to to stand up and make those microphones look ready for action so that we can jump right into your comments as well. Um, one, one thing we, we drew out in our discussion with each other was this question of um, otherness, right? Um, if, if we're working in, in, in populations as musicians that, um, that are not, not populations or not uh, communities that we come from, what is the work there for us? What is the work there f um, for the musicians, but for the young people we're teaching, or for the students in prisons or things? What is that divide of otherness? Is, is, is that a conflict? Is that an opportunity? Is it both? Who learns the most? I wonder if um, I, I could just throw that. Maybe Mike could, could jump in there. Sure. In terms of, uh, in terms of otherness at, between us as the sort of conductor, facilitator of the project. That's what I was thinking, yeah. Mm -hmm. Although you, you yeah. deal with multiple forms of otherness in your work. All kinds of work. otherness. Yeah. Um, I think it's particularly interesting for me, obviously, because I grew up here in the States and outside DC, and now I'm living in Jerusalem, working with Israelis and Palestinians in Hebrew and Arabic uh, and in English. Um, but there are a number of things that I think have made it possible for me to do good work in that environment and to, in many ways, there are lots of obstacles to overcome given that otherness, but in many ways that otherness also gives me a lot of access to both communities in an even-handed way. Mm -hmm. um, particularly if I, if I came from or identified specifically with either the Israeli side or the Palestinian side or only spoke, only spoke Hebrew or only spoke Arabic or only understood Western music or only understood Arabic music, I wouldn't be able to do the work that I do in terms of creating a space uh, that really can be inclusive and meet everyone where they are. Um, and particularly um, in, our, in, our, in our concert tomorrow, you'll see that our repertoire is far from that of a traditional choir. Um, I think we do one song that could, like from the classical tradition, period. Um, and only with a chamber choir that comes to specific extra rehearsals and has more access to that kind of soundscape because even in Arabic music, there's no concept of harmony. It's a melodic tradition. It's an improvisatory, heterophonic tradition rather than a harmonic or polyphonic one. So some of the kids in the choir come and for three years they've been in the choir and they still have trouble with the warm-ups 
but they can improvise poetry, sung poetry in performance, and, and no one can do what they do. So in many ways, having um, access to sort of both of those uh, backgrounds is very, very important, yeah. both in terms of spoken language and also in terms of musical language, not even to mention sort of all of the political understanding of uh, sort of both narratives and communities and, and all of those elements. That's so interesting. It, 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 I hadn't thought of it that way, but so interesting that, that your not being from either community gives you more fluency, fluency or fluidity between the two. Um, TJ, I wonder if you would talk more about the teaser you gave us about going to South Korea, um, ha having sort of yearned for that sense of belonging and whether that happened there or not, and, um, and how you deal with this question with international exchanges of, uh, of people being from different communities. Sure, to I think being adopted, this is something that maybe I've always had a, an eye or a, a, a part of my heart reaching out across the ocean and thinking that this is something that I needed to be a part of and I didn't quite know how. And so this uh, maybe was a, an obvious choice for me to go into this work and be passionate about international exchange. But I, I think this like, concept of otherness is particularly important for this program because we have these leaders of our profession from different countries who are traveling abroad and uh, engaging at very high levels. But I want to say from firsthand experience, it's been this professional versus amateur comment that was made earlier, I think Anton made it. It's been the experiences with the community, with the amateur, with the non-music reader, the person who is just joining for the first time, that have been perhaps the most impactful. And this is something that reminds us with every exchange, with every program that we put together, it's about the human connections we have. And so this otherness really becomes about us. And so, you know, for, for, for myself, being a child of adoption, maybe this is something that's always been on the forefront of my thinking. Um, but I see this played out time and again with our exchange program. Mm -hmm. So it's really that contrast of, of otherness versus that sort of more um, common experience that, that these musical opportunities give. Um, Aaron, I wonder if, if there's a, a perspective of this in the prisons that, um, that, that's part of your experience as an, as an educator. Yeah, I mean, TJ, when you say that the otherness is about us, I think that's, that's a great way of putting it, and that's certainly been our experience. And everyone that we have brought into the prison who comes from more of a kind of traditional arts learning environment um, has said how much they have learned from being in this environment and from working with people who are incredibly creative just maybe don't have the same resources that we have. I mean, you see these images that are and Andre told us earlier how, how the men melt M&Ms to take the paint or the, the color from the M&Ms to make paint. I mean, it's just crazy creativity. <laughs> and I think the other thing that I would say about otherness is that for as, as much as I recognize that I, my experience is not the experience of most of the people who are in the prison, I also have found connected connectivity in the community in ways that have surprised me. For instance, uh, I also am a conductor for an organization called the Boston Children's Chorus, which has a mission of bringing about social change through music. And I thought I knew my students pretty well. I thought I knew their families pretty well. And I was shocked one day uh, after conducting a performance, I turned around and one of the prison guards, they're the correctional officers, but one of those correctional officers was there. And it turned out that her niece sang in my choir. <laughs> Uh, and that was kind of a, a shocking moment to me to realize that this, you know, we put people in prison and we think that they are apart from us, we think that they are other, but the whole system continues to interact with our own lives in ways that we, we can't even possibly imagine. I think there's a, um, uh, the, the word humanization um, comes to my mind in, in a lot of these stories. and. Um, Certainly one of my um, sort of intellectual heroes in, in my work is Paolo Freire. Um, and, and it's like, you know, in, in that case, through dialogue, through sort of literal discussion with one another about the reality we see around us, how can we humanize one another? But in a sense, uh, the, the music, and, and, and actually I've, I've often struggled, with, in what way is music problematic when, when wanting to sort of um, learn from Freire? Um, because there is this sort of fixed thing so often called the repertoire. Um, but these moments, you're, you're discussing um, 
I, I think, resolve that in a really interesting way. This is very humanizing to, to have an opportunity to learn from someone else's creativity. Uh, Tom, I wonder if there's a thread here you want to pick up in your work. Well, I just think it's very, very hard, um, honestly. Um, I struggle with it all the time because as you, you talk about Paulo Freire, I mean, it's like there's power is involved, right? And even, even when I put myself in, in these positions where I'm trying to put um, instruments and, and singers and all kinds of people at the service of somebody else, and that feels in a certain way good, but it also means that we're controlling a lot. We're controlling the parameters, and, and the power does not go away. The power issues don't go away just because you say, here, I'm going to help you write a song, and you can have the stage, and you can have the song go how you want, and you can, you can do all of those things, but still, you're still determining a lot, even by the assignment. And so I feel like, you know, at, at Chekhov talked about, you know, trying to sort of squeeze the drops of slavery out of yourself one by one over a lifetime, you know, and slavery to what? In a way, slavery to, to our understanding of power and class and struggle. And it's, um, it, 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 I find it immensely challenging. And when Emily brought the thing up, I'm still thinking about Emily's, I don't know if you are, but I'm still thinking about Emily's problem. You know, she's just done a fantastic exercise and they, they've done this game and one of them is feeling like that was a catharsis and the others are like, I wish you'd never done that. And how you deal with that moment, you know, that to me that's another, so that's emblematic of, of the struggle that we have all the time in trying to expand the circles and do the work. It doesn't, it doesn't get easier. You learn techniques and you get better and you can appreciate otherness more, but it doesn't get easier in my experience. Mm -hmm. So the, the, we have uh, a mere 10 minutes left in our time together. Um, and I want to be sure that if you have things to contribute to this conversation or questions that you do. Um, so let me, in the Quaker style, let me leave a moment of silence in case someone is moved for a question. And if none of you come has on, one, come on, come we on, have a lot more we could say. <laughs> come on. You have a question. Someone's got a question. Someone has a comment. Someone thinks we're crazy. Come on. Uh, they're now they're racing. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, do any of you, because our art is so hard to produce, you know, quantitative evidence that we're doing good, and I loved what Stephen presented earlier because that was actually really helpful, um, but do, you, do any of you in your own program struggle with getting funding to continue the work that you're doing? Is that ever an issue, and how, how do you deal with it? I know when is it not, but you know, so, specifically with the projects that you do, yeah. how do you deal with those challenges? So um, just before you leave the microphone entirely, um, are, are you asking... Uh, specifically how programs like these get funding or how do you get funding and then do you ever struggle with with uh, continuing to receive funding over the long term because it's hard to prove what you're doing is success. I'm, okay, I'm asking this because it's something I encounter in uh, or at least I, when I do work in South Africa with HIV choirs they have a very hard time proving that what they're doing is actually creating change in their communities, and so. Right. Yeah, so there's, a, there's an increasing rhetoric around impact, right, in philanthropy, and let me see that you can prove that, the, you know, A plus B equals positive change. Um, who, who's feeling this issue the most and wants to start, yeah. Well, I'm happy to start. I mean, you have to, behind me, though, is that big red C from Carnegie Hall, so that means <laughs> that there's all this army of people behind me raising money. But the issues are the same, I think, in that this is not audience building. You can't argue that working in the prison is audience building, right? Or working with kids on probation is audience building. It's not, right? And to try to make that connection doesn't make sense. So what you really need are great thought partners who will help you think about how to assess the work to provide the qualitative, the, the anecdotal, the documentary, the, you know, the evidence that you need and that there, people who are aware of what the zeitgeist is around funding, you need thought partners to help you think about how you're going to measure the impact. And the good thing is that along with that, I think, you can also learn 
learn how to get better. That those evaluators or you know, thought partners can help you get better at the work and, make the, and, and actually increase the impact of the work. But, it, but I, the one trap that I see people falling into a lot is trying to, like, to answer the why question and failing. Like a, um, I don't know anything about the financial structure of your program, but is this an issue for you, fundraising? Um, well, I'm very grateful in many ways, actually, to the, the Yale alumni singing community, in large part, actually, for certainly providing almost entirely the funding for the chorus to come to this festival um, through a combination of a number of people who really believed in this idea and believed in the ethos of choral music and group singing creating social change. Even when I was here three years ago, before I had done anything, before I had just graduated and I was going to move to Jerusalem and I was here as sort of a conductor of this chorus that didn't exist. And, um, and already had a great deal of support, uh, particularly from Jeff um, and from a number of, of um, members of the Yale Alumni Chorus and the Yale Alumni Chorus Foundation. Um, and so that I am incredibly grateful, not only to their belief in the power of something like this, but also making things like this actually possible in a very tangible way, um, giving seed funding for the chorus even before it existed, and now um, basically bringing the chorus to the festival and making all of that possible. So I want to take a moment to So you're not you. only... Um you're not only uh, supported in the abstract, but you're talking to the room that makes your work possible. That's very exactly. nice. Exactly. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yay. We're the Yale Alumni Chorus people. Yay. Yay you. Either of you have a, a funding-related response? You don't have to. You know, as lofty as the ACDA International Conductors Exchange Program sounds, it is, uh, by and large, a, a, a product of volunteerism. And we are very fortunate to have like-minded individuals who are passionate about this. But one of our main challenges, or two of them, uh, one is sustainability and the other is scalability. You know, we have 28 conductors with the Sweden Exchange. How does that really translate to the other 10,000 ACDA members? And we have to try and find a way to communicate that. And I could give you anecdotal evidence of that. But really, you know, one of the things that we rely on is the goodwill and the volunteerism of those. Uh, so this last year, Jeff hosted two of our Swedish conductors here at Yale University, and they used this as a hub. And so we had them doing homestays. And we had you know, local rotary clubs providing lunches. And so this is something that I've never been ashamed to participate in. And I, I go after it vigorously. Um. Emily and I haven't spoken on this subject, but let me see if there's another subject uh, since we are low on time. Is there a way to operate without funds? Now, I'm thinking of a failed uh, chorus, and it's the a, a waiter staff of where I live, and all these teenagers come, and happy birthday is an embarrassment. And, <laughs> and, 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 and I'm thinking, well, in um, grade school, they don't have money. And I don't know whether you could teach primary or kindergarten teachers how to be teachers, or whether Cookie Monster could do a better job. Um, maybe, I don't know if Sesame Street works on music, but if we can, you, you will need to build the base. The Sunday school's gone, pretty much, for teaching music to these uh, at, the, at the first level. So, so the question um, is what to do. <laughs> so if, uh, if your scenario succeeds, we're all out of work. <laughs> so uh, we don't want this to work for free. <laughs> um, uh, it, it is an interesting question, and I think um, more, more and more people are worrying about this, especially as the sort of ubiquitous presence, presence of music education in schools. Um, has failed over the last 40 years, right? So that um, I think in many suburban districts that sort of everyone gets some musical training still exists, but in most urban districts it's not true anymore. Um, and um, so, so going back to this question of, of, well, it sounds like there's two questions. Does it rely on, on money and is there a way to ensure a kind of broad access? No, we know it doesn't. Can we find ways without money? Can we find ways without money? Um, no, we can't. We need money. And we need taxpayers to support music teachers in schools. 
That's what we need. It doesn't, I'm sorry, there's no volunteerism, in my opinion. And we can differ about this, but I think you need, you need, there needs to be support of music in schools. And we need, as you said, to do it all, to work with the preschoolers, to work with uh, the parents of the preschoolers, to work with kindergartners, to work with elementary. We've got to work on all the levels at once. It can't, it, there's, no, there's no silver bullet, in, in my opinion. I think they need. I think they 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 have some, and they need more support. But they we are also we are all of us in here, right? Are capable of making our voice known in terms of the importance of the arts and education. I think we can do it. I think we are poised um, with a tremendous opportunity when you raise the concept of the birthday song. The reason we don't sing it well is <clears throat> while it is a historical song written by three sisters, it's really not a very good song. <laughs> <laughs> and one of my next projects is to create a new l liturgy of birthday and celebration songs. Nice. Because we need them and we need to take advantage of this opportunity that we have in our culture, which is we sing at Christmas and at birthdays in public together spontaneously. Otherwise, we're pretty much choked. So um, stay tuned for a new birthday album. All right. Actually, it was my pleasure. Howard Goodall, you know, composer in uh, Great Britain, um, spoke at our Minnesota music convention about this project that goes on in the public schools in Great Britain, where they, it's the folk song project. And they have, they dedicate uh, at least like lunch hour, like half hour, 45 minutes every day, where everybody in the school, the teachers, the students, the janitors, the secretaries, go to the gym and sing these folk songs from out of their heritage because they're losing it there. And it's been a, a wildly successful thing, but it's the whole community doing it. So that may be one idea. Um, not just in bringing people into a special project, but getting the whole community doing that, including the adults who would need to model that for the children. You know, um, the, we talked earlier today um, about the disconnect between the formal and the community, between the kind of, um, uh, Dewey do talks about wanting to restore continuity between art and everyday life, right? So this idea is not new, that there's a need for more participation um, it, that will support every level of music making, right? That it, more people having an opportunity to get in on a amateur or choir or amateur um, orchestra means there's more people going to see those orchestras and, and professional choirs. Um, we, we may be up to our last comment or two, but go ahead. Uh. Okay, I can do two if you want. Um, <laughs> no, uh, just quickly, I have data. You're right, happy birthdays are a really hard song to sing. I've, I've, got, I've got lots of data. Um, the, speaking of the British government and speaking of funding um, music education, um, they recently spent millions of pounds on the Sing Up Project, which was run by Graham Welch. Some of you may know uh, Graham and his work. Longitudinal uh, across nationally, um, introducing singing into the schools to sort of restore the culture of singing in Great Britain. It was extremely successful, um, but it required a, it was an act of parliament, literally. I mean, they funded it from the government. Um, so it's kind of an interesting idea. Um, well, inspired by Jeff's um, morning lightning round, should we finish with a lightning round? Um, is there one piece of advice that each of us would have for people in the room about the, the challenge of expanding the circle, what, what one um, piece of advice might be, uh, things to consider when people want to get more into this work, maybe formally known as outreach? Um, I, I would say just to think about both practically and musically 
about meeting people or meeting whichever sort of community you're hoping to work with or um, or or impact or whatever you're whatever you're trying to do with that community, think about where to meet them, both in terms of sort of even thinking about like why someone would choose to join a, a group like this. Certainly in Jerusalem, I have to think a lot about incentives, about actually thinking about when everyone effectively in both Israeli and Palestinian societies is saying that what I'm trying to do is bad, why would somebody want to do something like this? Um, but also in terms of musical language, also in choice of repertoire and in choice of style and in choice of uh, pedagogy expectations, all of these, all of these things, Meeting, meeting people where they are rather than thinking again, I know this has also happened a lot today, but um, rather than thinking, okay, here is sort of the repertoire or like this is like really the best choral repertoire and therefore this is what we're going to teach, um, to really think about what kind of music moves the people that you're trying to work with already and how to create new musical spaces. If we're really trying to engage people who aren't already um, who don't already have access to, to choral singing or even to sort of group singing in, in any context, um, what, what kinds of tools do we have to reach those people in ways that will actually be interesting or meaningful uh, to them? Which isn't to say, um, particularly as, as Molly was saying earlier today about um, even finding this amazing meaning in uh, the sort of obscure piece by Handel, even for inner city kids in Chicago, not saying that that is not possible, but might be a difficult place to start. TJ. Well, I know that I'm speaking to the initiated, but may, perhaps this is something that we need to continue to advocate for ourselves in a very strong way. There was something recently that came out about um, trying to connect music to math as being an incorrect way to do this, and, and, and I certainly agree with that. We, we need to learn how to advocate. We need to continue to do it locally. I mean, we want, we want to think about otherness and we want to think about beyond our borders, but unless we have a strong community where we are, um, with those humans that we interact with, this is not going to be able to take flight, um, certainly isn't going to be, um, uh, get traction. I guess I would say, um, going into these environments, I found that it's very important to have no expectations, and that means being willing to reassess and reevaluate and question what you're doing and why you're doing it, and be willing to change, because you'll probably need to change your approach many times. So being open to that is very important. And I guess I'd just say, if, you're, if you want to work in a place, um, go visit there, spend time, work in the kitchen, sit in the lobby, talk to people, be there, show up for events that are not about your chorus, and see what's going on. So that there's a theme, and I guess I'll jump on the theme. Um, in, inherent in the work I do is uh, an attempt to just be there, um, to set up this uh, chamber ensemble where we live and work in this community. Um, but I, I guess th this, for me, goes back to, to Freire and to say, um, how can I approach a teaching situation as a learner? Right? And how can I know that I don't know all I'm going to know after the experience? Um, and I, I, I find it exciting in this maybe similar ways um, to what Micah was just saying, that it's also an experience of the repertoire learning and expanding, right? That we, we can celebrate and continue to play or sing some repertoire that we value. Um, I don't think it's about throwing out the canon to do something new, um, nor do I think you've, you've suggested that, but at, but at the same time, every era of musical composition grew by the circumstances of who was there and who was making music and contributing. So it's both about how do we as practitioners or educators approach a situation as learners, but also how are we stimulating newness and learning in the, in the art form itself. Thank you for your attention and interest, and uh, we will see you at the next one. Thanks so much. Thank you.